Yo, you are never out. Make some noise in this place. Come on, let's give God some glory. I'm so excited to be here tonight. It's like a, man, UIWI is like a family reunion. You know what I'm saying? I got a cut. I saw a dude owe me $5 from the line last year. Remember you couldn't get that sandwich? I gave you $5? Yeah, I'm going to need to get that back this time, dog. So uh, it's like a good family reunion, man. I love it. Being here and love everything that they're doing. Listen, tonight we want to jump in God's word. Uh, if you have your Bibles, meet me in the book of Exodus chapter 3. Book of Exodus chapter 3. Somebody say, woo. Yeah. Old Testament. Oh, Lord. Jeez. <laughs> I'm nervous. Uh, Exodus chapter 3. Begin reading at verse 1. Hear these words of our father. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over to see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for your word. <sighs> would you speak to us, O oh Lord? You're a God that disrupts darkness, so Father, would you tune our ear to your voice so that we might hear you ever so clearly. Turn our hearts toward you so that we might experience the fullness of all that you have for us. God, it's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us say, know, and do. Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Have your way in this place tonight. In Jesus' name. Every heart said amen. amen. Even if you don't know the Bible, even if you're not a church person, uh, this story is one of the most familiar stories uh, of all time. So even if you never know the Bible, if you don't know nothing about the Bible, but if you saw the Prince of Egypt, you right where I need you to be. You, you right there. You right in the cut. Right there. The only thing ain't going to happen, Mariah ain't going to walk out in Exodus chapter 4, uh, but, but, but you are right in the game. Moses... Moses is taken in, and he's in Pharaoh's house, but he's a Hebrew. Um, and our story picks up right after it happened. Right after it happened. He recognized that the slaves in the field look like him. And seeing the injustice and the darkness that Egypt was, in, it was how he was, uh, Egypt was oppressing the Hebrew slaves, the rage came about him. He went out and he saw an a, 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 a Egyptian oppressing one of the slaves and he got into a fight and he killed the Egyptian, murdered him dead. The next day, he walks out and he sees two Hebrews fighting each other. And he goes and is like, yo, what y'all doing? Stop doing that. And they say, well, what you going to do? You going to kill us like you did that Egyptian yesterday? Did you, did you see what happened? He saw darkness and oppression. And in his passion, compelled by the darkness he saw, he became overwhelmed by the darkness within. See, he became, he became so, uh, he, he, had the right, he had the right mission. I, I see darkness, I see oppression, I want to destroy it, I want to end it. He had the right mission. 
But the, but the darkness inside of him trumped the darkness outside of him. It's not the last time you're going to hear darkness and trump together in the same sentence. I'm just saying. <laughs> Too soon, too soon. I'm just, I'm just serious. I'm just serious. I'm just like, no, 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 for real though, for real, for real. It ain't gonna be the last time, for real. No, 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 I'm serious. <laughs> no, no, no. I ain't gonna go there yet. That's tomorrow. Listen, what I wanna talk about during our time together tonight as we get into God's word, I'm talking to leaders tonight. I'm talking, to, I'm talking to people who are on the front line. I'm talking to people who are out fighting injustice. And tonight, I want to just issue a warning. As we start this great weekend together, y'all know it's going to be off the chain. We're going to have a good time this weekend. We're gonna be, with the turn up is going to be real up in this joint. Like, it's going to be good. Uh, we're going to have a good time. But before we get started, and before you get all excited about taking the darkness in your city, I'm just telling you, we've got a God that wants to disrupt not just the, guard, the, the darkness that's in your city. We we got a guy that wants to disrupt the, garden, the darkness that's inside of you. And you might get like Moses and get so passionate about the mission that you might have the, the right mission, but the wrong power. Yeah, 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 you got the right mission. They need to die. That needs to come down. It needs to end. But you showed up and you killed a dude. Come on, Moses. Like it needs to stop, but do you need to kill him? And here's the thing, the problem wasn't that he killed him, the problem is that he did it in his power. Because let's hit fast forward. Moses is going to come back and they all going to end up dying. <laughs> Truth be told, he's going to take them all out, but he's going to take them out in God's power, not his power. I'm telling you, the strongholds in your city are going to come down. You got the right mission, but you ain't going to do it in your power. You're going to do it in the power of God. So in order for you to be used in your city to disrupt the darkness, don't you get out there too quick and, and not allow God to disrupt the darkness inside of you. See, it's like that lady on the plane when she be talking about some, some put, your, uh, put your mask on uh, before you start helping other people with their mask. I be thinking, lady, you ain't got to tell me that. I ain't helping nobody else put their mask on. I don't even know this lady. I, don't, I, I put my beats on so I ain't even got to hear her talking to me. I, I'm sorry. I'm not, you ain't got the last thing you got to worry about is me helping her breathe. She going to be wanting me to stop breathing because I'm going to be snoring in zero to five seconds. Like, you ain't got to worry about me helping nobody else. But you know why they do that. There, there, are, there, are, there are mothers and moms. Y'all know mamas. They'll go all day and not eat meat. They just be helping everybody else. They always helping other folks. So they know a mama will be on there, baby, put your mask on, baby, put your. <gasps> mama, what happened? Mama done passed out. Because mama putting on everybody else's mask and she ain't put hers on. They talking about mamas, I'm talking about ministry. Some of you spend your days putting a spiritual mask on other people, but you're spiritually suffocating yourself and you're wondering why you're about to burn out and pass out. You've become real good at giving scriptures to other people, but when was the last time you inhaled deeply from the well of God? He says, be careful because you'll get caught up in the mission and you'll be fulfilling the right mission, but you'll be doing it in your power. And the dangerous thing, you'll get good at it. You will learn how to do this thing and you'll perfect it and you'll be doing great ministry, great mission, but wrong power. God says, I love you too much to do that, so I'm going to disrupt the darkness within you. And he gives Moses the gift of obscurity. He gives him the gift of obscurity. See, 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 my, my problem in ministry, I'm talking to leaders, right? We're talking to leaders. Can we just keep it real? My problem is, it's too many leaders that only want to lead when the lights are on. And you, you only excited about the gospel when you can tell it from a microphone. See, we need some old school film anointing. Y'all remember old school film? Old school film back in the day was developed in the dark. 
We need some people that's willing to be developed in the dark. No, I ain't gotta. I ain't gotta be up front. Ain't, my name ain't gotta be put on it. I ain't gotta get all the credit. I ain't gotta be the center of attention. I can sit in obscurity. Sometimes God has to pull you out of the mainframe so He can disrupt your appetite for people and their approval. So you so fixed on people that you just need, you just waiting on your next hit. So you perform and you do good and you sit around after service waiting to get a hit, waiting to get thank yous, waiting to get applause, waiting to get appreciation, waiting to get love. Ooh, that word bless me. And it's like a crackhead fit, fixing himself because you just living from one hit from another hit. You watching the Facebook likes trying to see what am I up to now? Am I, do I have 10? Do I have 15? Can I get 20? Can I get 30? Oh, Lord, I broke 100. Oh, this is it right here. And you are addicted to people's opinion and approval. Every now and then, God does, God, 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 God blesses you and he gives you the gift of obscurity to disrupt the darkness. Uh, there, there, there are three other things I want to talk about that God does to disrupt the, uh, to disrupt the darkness in your life. Then we're going to go outside and break dance on, on some paper. Y'all good? Y'all ready? Y'all with me tonight? Y'all in here? Y'all with me? <sighs> Moses, so our text picks up in chapter 3. Moses, fresh from failure. Ah, this is what I love about God. Failure, messed up, murder, but God says, I'm still going to use you. You messed up royally. You failed miserably. You had the right mission, but you did it in the wrong power, and you didn't mess around and kill somebody. Lord, how much? just when he thought he was done, just when he thought he wasn't fit to be used, we see God saying, no, nah, I still got a purpose for you. I still want to move in your life. You're not done. I'm going to use that passion you got, and I'm going to do a thing in your life. Anybody in here ever messed up, ever failed miserably, but God still used you in your life. God still showed up in your life. He messed up, but we see Moses getting his groove back. Moses messed around, hooked up with Jethro. Jethro's daughter got married, got him a kid. So now he got a shorty and a boo. He didn't got his stuff together. I'm sorry for the three white people. I'm sorry. A shorty, significant uh, uh, offspring, a uh, boo, significant other. Uh, a significant other and an offspring. He didn't got his stuff together. He didn't got his groove back. He, my boy is back. He didn't. He ran from his family, now he got a new family. Didn't have a job, now he got a job. Look at him, he got himself going on. He didn't got himself together, he didn't figure it out. He got his job, and we see him in our text in chapter three. He's got his job, he take his flock, and he out in the wilderness, and he done went over to the other side. And while he was over the other side, living in the lavish of luxury, got his stuff together, got his, you ever, you ever see somebody when they got their ministry together, when they finally got it figured out, when they, was scruffing, when they was roughing it and couldn't figure it out, but then they finally figured it out. They got them three white people on their board, and they, they got it going on now. They like, they got it, they, they kicking it on a whole nother level. They, they didn't got it. They didn't, they didn't moved up a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, he, he got himself together. Relax, relax. It's going to be all right. Calm down. It's going to be all right. Calm down. Breathe, baby. Breathe. Breathe. He, he's got himself together. And just when he got himself together, God taps him on the shoulder and says, it's time to begin again. Because I didn't call you to comfort, I called you to kingdom. It's time to begin again. I didn't call you to get all comfortable and get everything all situated and get everything. No, no, no. I've called you to my kingdom. Unless the comfort calls you to miss the kingdom that's inside of you, I am tapping you on your shoulder and I'm calling you out of comfort so that you might answer the call of kingdom and not compromise. He says, because there's a darkness that comes with comfort. See, we talk about the failure over here and the murder. We know that, we know that darkness. I, what about the darkness of success? Sometimes the darkness is not because you missed it. Sometimes the darkness is that you figured it out. Because the moment you figured it out is the moment that you lost the dependency and the desperation upon God. You used to pray an hour before you used to go speak. Now you're just running up in there speaking, making up stuff. What happened to the desperation? What happened to the dependency? He says, I've pulled you away and I'm tapping you on your shoulder and I'm calling you to begin again. I'm calling you to do a new thing. Moses, I've got an assignment for you and I've got an assignment. The difference between this time and the last time is this time you're going to do it in my power. 
So I'm disrupting the darkness of comfort that says, I'm settled, I'm good, I don't need to do nothing. No, 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 no. It was never about your comfort. It was always about my kingdom. I'm calling you to begin again. The burning bush catches on fire. Now, I used to live in Mississippi. When I lived in Mississippi growing up as a little boy, listening to this story, I thought the miracle was that the bush caught on fire. Then I moved to California and realized bushes catch on fire around here all the time. That ain't nothing. That's normal. That's Tuesday. Like, that ain't. That's boom, bush on fire. That's, you know what I mean? That's just how it gets down out here in California. You know what I mean? Walking with my kids, and boom, bush, fire. There you go. Move back. Don't get burned. The miracle was that the bush not only caught on fire, but it kept burning. Then the bush started talking. Now, usually bushes don't start talking unless you've been smoking bushes before, and then they start talking. They won't even know it's you if you just look straight ahead. You won't even look guilty. See, you feeling guilty, don't you? We don't even know it. We just, just look straight ahead and just look. Just act like it ain't even you. Just act like, just act like you don't even smell like it right now. Just act like it. Who the sun set free is free indeed, even from weed. Act like it right now. The bush, the bush starts talking and speaking. And he has this powerful moment and it's God saying, Moses, I'm disrupting the comfort that you've set up in your life and I'm calling you to kingdom. Watch this. The Bible says, that God doesn't say anything else until after he sees that Moses has left his post and stepped over and inquired. It says Moses inquired of the voice, and after he inquired of the voice, then God spoke. Could it be that we waiting on God to speak, and God is saying, I'm waiting on you. It, it, it's kind of like this, y'all. These, these, these bath. I was in the airport the other day. These bathrooms confusing me, y'all. I t it took me 20 minutes to figure out how to wash my hands. Cause the thing ain't got no knob on it. It ain't got no knobs. Y'all know what knobs are, don't you? I'm sorry, that's that Mississippi language. Y'all know the, the, the little thing. It ain't had no twisting, so I'm like, and ain't nobody else in there. So I, you know, usually you just stand back and just kind of look. And then the, and so. I'm, Up in there, after a while, I thought I was up in there, nay nay, and just watch me whip, watch me nay nay, watch me whip, whip. Yo, I promise, I ain't making this up. I promise, I was in there, and then I just said, some just said, just put your hand up under. So I just did like this, I did like this. And the water came out. <laughs> it's something about, it wasn't until I extended my hands that the water came out. Soon as I put my hands out, then the water flowed. Some of you are waiting on the water of God to flow in your life. And God is saying, I'm just waiting on you to put your hands out. And if you just put your hands out, then you can receive the power and the flow. He's saying, you make your move. You waiting on me to move, I already moved. I moved on Calvary's cross, your turn. What does it mean for you to extend your hands and say, God, I don't, want the, I don't want the comfort of this world to cause me to miss the calling of the kingdom that's on my life. So I'm willing to let go of the comfort, extend my hands, and depend on you to provide the living water for my soul. It says I've come to disrupt the comfort. Number two, he, he goes and he says, all right, You've inquired, and then God speaks, and he says, all right, first thing you need to do is take your shoes off. Take your sandals off, because you are standing on holy ground. You want to know the hardest thing about ministry that we do? I'm talking to leaders, right? 
One, one of the hardest things that we do, one of the most challenging things about the leader is that many of us, we serve at the burning bush on a regular basis. It's a part of our job, it's a part of our weekly rhythm to be at the very place where the burning bush speaks. We, we, we serve in churches, we serve in youth groups where the glory of God, where the power of God, where he always speaks. And one of the most dangerous things of being where the burning bush is and where the burning bush is always speaking is that it becomes so familiar to you, you get so comfortable that you just start walking in with your shoes on. You start walking in with your shoes on because you, you, used to, you used to take them off and surrender, but you'd be like, I ain't got, time, I got so much stuff going on. You've gotten so familiar with the glory of God. You've gotten so familiar with the power of God. You've gotten so familiar with the burning bush that you just walk into his presence with your shoes on. You just walk in with familiar. You just walk in in your power. You just walk in in your strength. You just walk in in your muscle memory. You just walk in with what you know. And God says, I'm going to use you, but I'm only going to use you if you you stand in my power, so you got to take your shoes off. Take your shoes off. Why? Why, Moses? Because, because the dung of your past will taint the ground of your future. You've been walking around and you got dung, you got mess on your feet, and the mess on your feet you can't track into this place, this new season that I'm calling you into. So take your shoes off. So that you can remove the thing that's in between you filling the ground of your father and your flesh. What, what's in between you and God? What's the thing that's in the way keeping you from experiencing the full? I want you to take your shoes off. I want you to be able to put the toes in my power, in my ground. I want you to feel the ground that you're standing on. Because listen, here's the deal. If you can't take your shoes off here, you're going to Pharaoh. And when you stand in front of Pharaoh, you need to be reminded of what my ground feels like. You're going to stand before Pharaoh and you're going to stand in my power. But listen, don't think you'll never be able to do the work if you don't do the worship. You'll, you'll never be able to do the work in front of Pharaoh if you don't do the worship here. I need you to take your shoes off so that you might be reminded of how good your father is, how great your father is, how big your father is, how powerful your father is. I need you to take your shoes. Some of you are sitting in this room and you've gotten so comfortable in ministry. You've gotten so familiar. You hadn't taken your shoes off in a long time. When was the last time you took your shoes off? And experience the fullness of his power. It's kind of like this. Uh, Walt Disney's daughter wrote a book about growing up as his daughter. And she wrote a book about her, her dad, Walt Disney, the founder of Disneyland and Disney World and all that. And he, she wrote a book, and in the book, it just captured the essence of how normal her dad was. And how normal her childhood was. Matter of fact, her childhood was so normal. She says, when I went to school for the first time, I went to school, I went to class, I stood up and I introduced myself. I said, hello, my name is Diane Disney. And she tells in the story, she tells in the book of how the classroom went crazy. They started laughing, they started clapping. They started, they was like, oh! It freaked her out. She started crying. She thought they were making fun of her. She looked at the teacher. She said, why are they, why are they laughing? Why are they clapping? She says, she says, they're happy for you. She said, why? She said, didn't you say your name was Diane Disney? She said, yeah. She said, what's your daddy's name? She said, Walter. And then she, the, the teacher said, Walt Disney? She said, no, yeah, Walter Disney. And the kids went crazy again. They started clapping and stuff. I don't know if they was clapping because they thought they was going to get tickets. Or <laughs> y'all know how we do. Y'all be like, yo. Can a brother get two tickets for me and my cousin? You know what I'm saying? Some of y'all, that's how y'all got in here tonight, trying to get, can I get, yo, can I get, yo, can I get that pass? Yo, what's up, can I, yo, can I, what, what how much for one and a half pe people? Cause I'm only coming for two days. Uh, she said, she said, Walt Disney, the, the, the Walter Disney, the kids went crazy again. She says, she says, sweetie, your dad, your dad is Walt Disney. like. Like Disneyland? Like, like Mickey Mouse is your pet? <laughs> like Goofy is your cousin? Like Disneyland? And she tells the story, she says, she, 
She had never made the connection before. She had no idea. As a matter of fact, she goes home to her dad. Her dad's sitting there with the paper in his hand. She goes home. She snatches the paper out of his hand and says, you didn't tell me you were Walt Disney. In the book, she says she walks around for the next month stunned at who her father was. I'm telling you, when you take your shoes off and you encounter the power of the Holy Spirit, you should be stunned at who your father is. It should blow your mind of how good your God is. It should mess you up when you think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for you. It ought to blow. You ought to be stunned at who your father is because he ain't the father of Disneyland. He's the father of all the land. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first. He is the last. He is the rose of Sharon. He's the bright and morning star. He is the I am that I am. I'm talking about your daddy. I'm talking about your father. He's a good, good father. You ought to give him some glory in this place. Oh, come on. You ought to give him some glory in this place. You ought to be stunned at who your father is. It ought to mess you up when you think about how big your God is. You ought to be stunned at how great your God is. Turn around and tell three people, take your shoes off. Don't, don't trip, it's a metaphor, it's a metaphor. Stop, don't you do that. You got on Toms, that ain't gonna be a good look for nobody. Don't you take the arm. Them Toms, you know, mess you up. Listen, he says, he says, I wanna disrupt. I wanna disrupt this thing in you that you've picked up now that you've been doing ministry for a little while. It's this thing that says, you gotta be the savior. It's this thing that if you don't do it, it won't happen. It's an, I call it, I call it, I call it, this is what I call it. I, I say, everybody needs a, a Maury Povich anointing. Y'all not going to go with me tonight. I said, I said, you need a Maury Povich anointing. Y'all, y'all, it, it, listen, it, I'm just going to be honest. It's culturally problematic, but theologically advantageous. Uh, here's the deal. Maury Povich and his show, uh, I admit, culturally problematic but theologically advantageous. Uh, he, there's a saying that has come up out of his show, you know, where they trying to figure out who the daddy, who the daddy, who the baby daddy, who the baby daddy, who the baby daddy. Culturally problematic. Theologically, this is gonna bless you, watch this. He says, and, and, and he's got a famous line, famous line. He's known for it all across the world now. At the end, he pulls out the little blue paper and he says, you are not the father. I feel like you need to have an anointing where you can remind yourself, although everything's going on, you need to be able to look in the mirror and say, you are not the father. Jesus is. You ain't the savior. Jesus is. You are not the father. So the weight of the ministry should not rest on you. It should rest on the father who Jesus is. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, you are not the father. He disrupts the darkness that creates an unhealthy syndrome that makes you think that it's all about you. He disrupts the darkness that causes you to comfort. And finally, I love this one. It goes on a little further in our passage, in our text, in chapter 3. Moses says, okay, you want me to go? Tell Pharaoh to let your people go. I get it. That's the assignment. I took my shoes off. I've come clean in this moment. Now I get the assignment. Lord, how you going to pick my weakest attribute to be the main thing that you want to use for this challenge? You, 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 no, 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 I got a speech problem. Isn't it just like God to use your weakest attribute to bring his greatest glory? 
Some down, sometimes he'll get, you'll, you'll find yourself with less resources. Sometimes he'll, he'll turn down your strength so that he can turn up his glory in your life. He'll turn down your strength so he can turn up his glory, which answers the age-old question, turn down for what? <laughs> he says, I'm turning down your strength so that I can turn up my glory. I don't know about y'all, but everybody that talk about me, I know everybody talk about you be lying. But there's some folks that say stuff about me that they wouldn't lie. There's some stuff in me that's messed up. There's some areas in my life where I struggle. There's some areas where I ain't got it all together. I know when everything everybody said about you was a lie. And I know you just, you just good and you ain't never done nothing wrong. But there's some weak areas. And sometimes Satan will use those very same weak areas, those places of shame, those places of guilt, to make me think that I'm not fit for, 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 for ministry. That I'm not fit to go and fight this darkness. That I'm not fit to go and say to Pharaoh, let my people go. Because of my speech impediment. Because of the, all, my own practical challenges that ain't made up. That's real. Yeah. That's, what, that's when you've got to be able to divinely look at facts. But also divinely look at truth. And you've got to be able to know the difference between the facts and the truth. My, my mentor, Bishop Kenneth Armour, he says it this way. He says, you've got to be able to look at the facts in your life and the truth in your life. You've got to be able to tell the fact is, I'm tired, I'm weary, I'm worn out. But the truth is, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. You've got to know the difference between the facts and the truth. The fact is, the devil is busy and he's wreaking havoc in my neighborhood, but the truth is no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper. You got to know the difference between the facts and the truth. The fact is, I got haters and folks talking about me. I got friends backbiting. I got all that, but the truth is greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The fact is, I cried myself to sleep last night, but the truth is, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. The fact is I'm tired. I don't know if I can praise him another second, but the truth is I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. you got to look at the facts and the truth, and you've got to know God has come to disrupt the darkness that says Shame has disqualified you. Your weakness has disqualified you. It's a lie. It's a dark lie. He says, you need to trust and know that I've got a purpose. I've got a plan for your life. And although it may look hard, although the idea of standing before Pharaoh may look impossible, I will get you through this. Some of you are going home to some impossible feats, some impossible challenges. It seems like the deck is stacked against you. Let me encourage you. Not only is he, uh, un, not only is he disrupting the darkness, but he's also unleashing the light. And you need to trust that he is going to complete that thing that he started in you and in your ministry. I am... Um, Ah, I'm a big Rocky fan. Yeah. I don't know about y'all. I'm a big, I'm a big Rocky fan. I love Rocky, all of them, but Rocky Four is my favorite. Rocky, is that the, that's the one with the Russian? Is that the one with the Russian? Y'all, yeah. that Russian was beating Rocky. Lord have mercy. Y'all, I'm telling you, I was messed up. I'm watching it, and I'm, I'm sitting there. I, I didn't start it praying for Rocky. I'm up there. I'm, so, I'm saying, Lord, help Rocky, Lord. Help him, Jesus, Lord. I started, I started going in. My wife was, she's, she's, we went through therapy for that one. But uh, I started praying for Rocky, y'all. I'm up and I'm walking around and I'm just, Lord, Rocky, Lord. And then some spoke, some said, Albert, there's a Rocky Five. <laughs> oh, yeah. So if there's a Rocky Five, that means he ain't going to die in Rocky Four. This ain't the end. This ain't the last fight. You know, when you realize it ain't the end and when ain't the last fight, when I realized it was a Rocky Five, child, I got me some popcorn. I sat down. I got me some pizza. Got me a beer. I mean, a Coke. And I, uh... I got... And I, I could enjoy it because knowing that there was a Rocky Five changed how I watched Rocky Four. 
I guess what I'm trying to tell you is if you're in a rocky forum, my sister, hold on. My brother, hold on. You need to know as long as God is on the throne, there is a rocky five. And it ought to change how you watch in rocky four. It ought to change how you go through this next season. You need to go through this next season knowing that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and who are the called according to his purpose. He's come to disrupt the darkness. What would it mean for you tonight to let go and stick your hands out and inquire of the Lord's voice? Come into his holy presence and take your shoes off. And there, hear his mission and receive his power for his call on your life. He's come to disrupt the darkness. But before you go do the work in Egypt, you've got to do the worship in his presence. Before you go tackle the darkness out there, God says, come here, my son. Come here, my daughter. I want to tackle the darkness in here. All over the room, would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? If you're in this room and you say, um, Albert, if I was to tell the truth, there's some darkness inside of me that I need to deal with tonight. There's some darkness inside of me that I sense God is saying. He's saying, I want it all. I want it all. I don't know what it is. I don't know where it is. I don't know how it is. But if you find yourself here in this great conference, listening in seminars about how to chase the darkness out there, but you've fallen victim to a darkness inside of here, God says, I want it all tonight. What would it mean for you to surrender and invite him into the dark places of your life? I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to ask you to do something that's going to require a little, a little courage. If you say, Albert, I got some darkness inside that needs to be dealt with tonight. I've got some areas that need to be surrendered tonight. God wants to disrupt some stuff inside of me. If you're ready to surrender those things over to God, I'm going to ask you to do something. I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. If that's you and you're ready for God to disrupt some darkness inside of you, if that's you, just stand up right where you are. Just stand up right where you are. Just stand up right where you are. Father, there's some darkness in my motives. There's some darkness. Some of you, there's some darkness in some relationships. There's some darkness in my behavior. There's some darkness in unforgiveness and bitterness. Jesus, I dare not go chase the darkness out there and not invite you to deal with the darkness in here. God, disrupt the darkness. Disrupt the darkness. If that's you, Regardless of where you are, just stand, if that's you. If that's not you, just pray for the people that are standing around you. Let's begin to intercede on their behalf. All to those, all those that are standing, as if you're receiving water, would you just stretch those hands out for it? Just oh, palms up, palms up. Uh -huh. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you with our hands wide open. Father, our hands are open, symbolizing two things. Number one, symbolizing that we're not holding anything back. No concealed weapons, Father. No hidden secrets. But we open ourselves up to you and we say, Lord, all of me needs all of you. So, Father, our palms, are, we surrender all. We let it go. Letting go comfort, letting go the things of this world, letting go sin, letting go addiction. God, whatever, whatever it is that will keep us from fully engaging in the mission and the purpose that you have for our lives and for our ministry, Father, we let it go right now. Some of us, it ain't the shame and the failure that messed us up. It was the success that messed us up. So, Father, we let go of the arrogance that comes with success. We let go of the false confidence that tells me, I got this. I've been doing it for 20 years. I've been in the game. I got 15 years. We God, we let go of the confidence that comes with familiarity and we say, God, I'm desperate for you. 
I'm des- if, if you don't do it, God, it won't get done. I don't want to do it in my power. I don't want to do it in my strength, but I want to do it for your glory. That means it requires your power, your strength, Father. I'm a vessel broken and yielded for your glory. So, Father, not only do I let go, but I'll open up so that I might receive your purpose, your plan, your promise, your power, Father. Fill me. Fill me with your spirit, God. It's about your glory, not about me. It's about your kingdom. These are your children. These are your neighborhoods. These are your churches. Forgive me of the arrogance of thinking that it's mine. God, it's yours. It's all yours. So, Father, I give them back to you. And I invite you into the dark places. And Father, this isn't a momentary visit. Holy Spirit, we invite you to dwell here. Father, would you stay here? Would this become your permanent residence? May this not become a conference peak, but Father, may it become a new normal, a new reality. I daily take my shoes off, stick my hands out, and I get in your glory. I never step out to do the work until I do the worship, until I'm reminded of how good my Father is, of how faithful my Father is, of how big my Father is. I should be stunned daily in awe of who you are. So, Father, I pray for a new normal. I pray for a new normal that we would walk here, that we would learn to dwell here. Father, thank you so much for disrupting the darkness. Now, Father, for your glory, unleash the light in Jesus' name. Every heart said amen. 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 God bless you.